joined today by James Palliser. Um, this is a little bit of an unusual talk um, because we're actually going to be talking not about a project we've done, but a project which we're about to do. Feel free to ask James as many hard questions as you'd like. This is his first day at work. Um, <laughs> Um, but he did do very well in his exams a month or a week or two ago. So, James is actually going to, this is an interactive session because I asked him if I could make, talk about what we were going to do. Because as will become clear, we really would benefit from the whole community giving us some feedback about what we ought to be doing. So, without much ado, a little bit about Embercosm. Uh, we're a freely licensed open software house developing embedded software tools and we're very much in the embedded space. We currently do the GNU tool chain. Um, we will start looking at LLVM in the future and the other thing we do is hardware simulation and Verilator which is a, another GPL licensed compiler and it grows very well. Founded in 2008, based in the UK, four staff, uh, Jörn Renneker, who I know many of you know, leads our GCC work, I lead on GDB and hardware modeling. And in the GCC space, we're responsible for the Adaptiva Epiphany architecture, which is a multi-core floating point chip, um, which you may have seen, because part of its story is the fact that it was developed without huge VC funding. Um, as an example of how you can develop a leading edge chip with little investment. And we have uh, Oleg Reagan from Adaptivus here for the last half We do the synopsis R processors. We do a lot of work with open risk because we're quite heavily involved with free and open hardware and the ability to demonstrate your technology where the chip itself is freely available. You can go and burn it onto your own FPGA, you can modify it, you can give modified versions to people. It's actually quite important. And the other thing I'll talk about at the end we do have some involvement with Marcos. So the subject, why are we interested in energy and power? Here is a phone from a decade ago, the Ericsson T65, um, 720 milliamp lithium ion battery, 300 hours of standby time, you can talk on it for 11 hours, and it has a pretty good predictor of how much talk time and standby time you've got left. And then, a year or two ago, we get the Sony Ericsson Xperia. It's got a bigger battery, a lithium polymer, 930 milliamps, but it only stands by for three or four hours, and you can only talk for three and a half, four hours. So that's progress for you. Um, here's another one for you. This is from the BBC website observing that one of the problems that mobile apps have is that all those advertising that comes with your free application drains the battery. So battery is a bit of a problem. Now this graph, the bottom half of this graph is based on fact. It's work by LSI Logic and Mental Graphics looking at the potential to improve battery life, to make your device more efficient. And if you leave it until the stage where you're laying out the silicon, you've got not much scope by then. If you work with gates a bit more, if you work at the level of Verilog, of the HDL, RTL, potential to say what, if you work at the architecture and design efficiency, power and energy efficiency in the architecture, you can say a lot more. And then the top four, which is where me and my colleague Kirsten A. at Bristol University, have started doing some work, we believe that higher up you have even more control over what a device is doing and potentially you could make battery life even better if you started to work at the instruction set, at the programming language, in the compiler and in the application. Now it makes a nice graph but it is still speculation, lots of opinion, few facts. Yeah. So all power of this year is about CPU power? Or? Uh, we'll keep it for, for now, let's talk about CPU power. You're quite right, it's whole system power that concerns us. And in a phone, a third goes on the radio, a third goes on the screen, a third goes on the CPU, and 10% goes on everything else. So this is particularly looking at one aspect of the problem. So where are we with energy taken today? 
The things that go on in hardware are really quite extraordinary. The steps taken to minimise power loss, multiple crop domains, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, multiple mode operation, and basically all based on the simple formula P is V squared R. So if you can drop the voltage, you can save a lot of power. Um, and there's a huge range you can do that. So the hardware engineers have done their bit. But the question is, what about the software guys? And you think that ought to be where we can do much better, because ultimately the software controls the hardware. It's the algorithms, the data flow, it's the compiler optimizations. And typically you have a minus O3 switch to go as fast as possible, a minus OS switch to go as small as possible, but there isn't a minus OP switch to go as low power as possible. Hardware engineers dream, think, sleep, eat, nothing but saving power. Software engineers don't realise that computers use power. Um, famous case of a system that was burning power like nobody's business, and they eventually traced it down to a flashing cursor. It kept on waking up to flash the cursor. Turn the cursor off, 70% drop in power consumption. So, it's a ripe space to look at the choice of algorithm, the data handling, and the instruction set architecture and compiler. And drilling down, that's where we start to get interested. And ultimately, the bottom line, energy is consumed by the hardware, but the hardware is controlled by the software. So, one thing to notice is that this is an area that people have been talking about for a long time. This is a paper from 15 years ago which describes the steps to take to make software more efficient, choosing the algorithms to fit the hardware, tuning the algorithms to the memory and the memory access, optimizing for the performance, using parallelism, using hardware support. Obviously, software engineers still don't do this, okay? And the potential is for the compiler to help here, which is where we're starting to get interested. So that brings us to our project. And we're looking just at the compiler's role in this. So we're just chewing out one little bit of that story. So other people worry about applications, I say it's... One of the questions is, do your compiler choices, your compiler decisions, affect the amount of energy consumed by an application? And one of the things that I made a very, I made me say very early on, is to understand that we're really interested in energy in other words, the total amount of energy consumed, not the rate at which it's consumed, which is the power. It's no use being low power if your program takes forever to run because you'll end up using a lot of energy and flat your battery anyway. So it's actually the total energy used that matters. And how influential is the compiler? If I choose different compiler options, will my program use less energy? Okay. And sometimes that may be some of the suggestions are that may be a matter of just running as quick as possible, get it over with and turn the computer off. Or it may be more subtle than that. One really subtle point brought out to me by a, a deeply embedded microcontroller engineer. If you have a loop in a program that's running at a flash, or something like an AVR microcontroller might do, if it's a small loop, let's keep it in one row of the flash, 128 bytes. Because if it straddles two rows, I have to wake up two rows of flash, and that burns energy. And when you, some of these things are designed to run off a, a little AA cell for 15 years. So you start worrying about that. So there are potentially quite deep areas as well as quite broad strategic areas. But the problem is no one actually knows. Because for all the opinions you hear, there isn't any experimental data. And that's what our project is. What James will be doing for the next three months is to actually measure how much power programs use and what happens if you change the compiler. Um, we're doing it jointly with Bristol University um, and something called the Energy Aware Computing Initiative, which is a European-wide initiative, but it's led for Bristol. Um, and look it up, and you're welcome to join anyone who join in on that. Um, one of the things that Bristol have got down to a fine art is the ability to measure power consumption accurately and a fine time granularity so we can get good accurate measures of the ongoing power consumption and then by integrating the total energy consumption. 
So we're going to measure the energy consumption by a representative set of programs. And one of the things we'd like you to help us with is suggestions for what that set of programs reasonably ought to be. The next question is, do compiler options have any impact? Should we just optimise for speed, because get it done with is the best thing you can do? Or are there other optimizations that perhaps by localising memory use mean that the memory burns less power? Does the choice of compiler make a difference? Um, we have the advantage that some of the architects we're using will work with MLVM as well. And is this something that has an architecture effect? Do we find that some architectures are incredibly sensitive to the compiler options for their bad consumptions while others aren't? And we're going to work with the XMOS architecture, um, with ARM, and with Epiphany. And ARM has merit, we can actually do comparative tests with LLVM and GCC because it supports both, it, both compilers support it. So that's where your help is needed. And where I'm going to start with your suggestions. I'm going to put this slide back up in a moment because that's where we'll finish at. But I just want to talk a bit about what, having got the information, where we're going to go in the future. Some of you will know about this project. Milepost, it was a European project funded by EU, finished three years ago. And it came, it's aimed to develop the idea of iterative compilation. How do you find the best compiler options for your program? Answer. Try them all exhaustively and see which one is best. And you can take a little program and six months later come up and say these are the best compiler options. And it can be quite beneficial. You can double the performance of a program, but it's not practical for the real world. But the observation was that certain types of programs seem to go well with certain types of optimization. So since we have knowledge systems that can learn couldn't we put a traditional learning engine onto that and start to learn what sort of optimization? So we'll take a big set of programs, we'll try them all with different sets of compiler options and learn what makes them work best. And because it's a learning system, it will make relationships, it will determine relationships that we didn't know about. And then the nice thing after that is that you can put in a new program and it will say, well, based on all those programs I've seen before, I've learned this is the best set of compiler options. But the nice thing about this approach is, it is a general, general training algorithm. And if we actually have a way of measuring the speed or the size of a program, but of measuring its power consumption, which is what we do now have, then potentially we can train a database so that you could use milepost, and you can have a milepost database that would allow you to select the GCC options are best for power consumption for your program. So that's where we see the future going with what we see. But this summer's project is just to get the base data. So that's all the formal talk wants to say. James has got his notepad out. So can I ask the comments and suggestions, and someone wants to make a comment right at the back there, to help us on our way? Yes. Okay. I've come at this from other areas in, in the 23 years of work on GCC, not necessarily in terms of the embedded space. But some of the things include, particularly as if you're dealing with people who generate the hardware, is restrict your register set, set for example, ARM and, and the thumb and, and all that kind of stuff, where you, in the code, you know, you have oftentimes code that is needs to be fast and, and you don't care how much power they take because that's the primary part of the purpose of that. But the, other three quarters of the stuff you want to run possibly slower. They might use fewer registers so that um, you, you compile the you don't have to power those registers. Multiple units are, are, are oftentimes things so you know you just pretend you don't have a multiple unit and instead of shipping it off off chip depending on, on the architecture of the chip. Okay, so there we are. There's one for us to try restricting the register range. And, right. see, and measure what the benefit is, because this is a this is to get base data. And one thing I should say is, the results will be published in an open access journal, and that was one of the conditions of them because of funding the project. But so you will be able to read. In terms of restricting the register range, what you really want is, is to talk to the RCOS kernel, so that it doesn't actually have to save the registers on an interrupt. So you could, for example, have one cast that's only compiled using four registers, and when it when 
the RCOS kernel swaps in that thing, it doesn't touch the other 12 registers in the thing, and, and so forth. And it's highly dependent on the chip that you use. You know, I would imagine that what works for ARM will not work for x you know, except at a high level. And then the second is also looking at things like not using the same option for everything. We have in the compiler now the ability to change on a per function basis what the options are. And again, you have, is this a fast function, is this a slow function? Right. Okay. okay, that's useful. Can I just ask, could, could you tell me your name? And anyone who makes a suggestion, let us know your name, because then James can come ask you to explain it. And if you... Okay, I'm Michael Meissner, M-E-I-S-S-N-E-R, and I currently work at IBM. Thank you very much. Yes. Sub-bullet number two and sub-bullet number one, hasn't the University of Binghamton in New York, they have actually done a pretty comprehensive research on it and actually have published several papers on it. Have you looked at those? No. So more useful data. And as I said, what we found, we've looked at a lot of papers. What we haven't found is a set of data, data sets that say this is actually the measure. Because relatively few people actually go to the trouble of finding grain power measurement. It's just starting to happen. Um, but yeah, they may have missed stuff, so we'd like to know. I have another question. You're, you, you said you're using Icarus Verilog to measure power? No, 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 that's what Enlocos and my company will provide you with maintenance services for Icarus Verilog. That's just about us. That's my sales pitch on the first slide. Um, we're using well, uh, basically, it's a, a voltmeter across a resistor to see what the power consumption is, but it's a bit more sophisticated than that. It's hardware. It's a hardware power measurement. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, I had a request on one that I'm using for my game tomorrow. You're using Micro's GCC. That That's the, for the future. That's how we could exploit it. If we had this data, we have this ability. If, if there are two schools of thought out there, one says, it doesn't make any difference, so why bother? The other says it's terribly important. If it turns out to be terribly important, then it, I think Marlboro's is a natural framework in which to make it work. Is there something in my book at GCC that we would like in trunk? Yeah, we'd like it in trunk as well. So if you folks are working on it, I think it would be a natural yeah, so volunteers. <laughs> we, we, we love to. So what we need is lots of big fat contracts. So in the for profit, I can free Yerna to do what he wants to do, which is to work on Marvel. Yes. Uh, I think that um, I think it's going to be the NC test. We have, but NC is not free, and we want we want to publish all this stuff so other people can duplicate it. So science. So as in actual science. Yes, real science. It's very important to us as a, actually for our company, we want as many people as possible to read this. And, you know, my blunt commercial dates, I want them to see Emma because I'm paid for it. 
come to us and say you're a good company, and that means it's got to be open and fully available. So and also, MBC has several no notable problems that several of us have run into over the years. Yep. So I, I can't necessarily recommend, particularly the automotive section of MBC, which I hate for the passion. <laughs> So uh, one the starting set of programs I have is the set of programs that we used on the original Marvel Post World, because that's a set of about 20 programs that are a useful set. But I'm very happy to be pointed at other sets or you know other approaches. Yes. So there is a certain amount of these architectures are there for because it was convenient. Um, the project starts today, but I'm very open to anyone who says, yes, you've got a board, I can get it to you very quickly. Um, Exmos is because Exmos is a Bristol company and we already have our hands on that kit. Epiphany is, as I mentioned, one of our customers, and we have hands on that kit. And on is just they're all over the computer lab, so we can just use them. Um, but uh, I did write to a number of other companies that I have relationships with to say, would you be interested in being involved? And some said yes, and some said no. Um, one suggestion, uh, using, uh, using the you know, open source uh, OS is like Android or OS to, to measure power consumption. And you know, to use those benchmarks. Yeah, to use the settings I've done in this test yeah. suite. Yeah, it was a LTP. That's all. Yeah. And one of the others I've considered was it might be interesting to actually measure the power consumption of running something like the GCC regression. That's a whole load of little programs. Yeah. Um, just as an exercise, I'm not sure how that means. Thank you. 
is that it will not backed by any. So, so there are, at the hardware level, there are some. If you go right down to the, the lower level, the silicon, the layout, and the gates, there are actually really quite rigorous and well um, tuned hardware models. But the trouble with these hardware models is that if you can get up to one cycle per second, you're considered to be going extremely fast. Which means when you come to look at whole programs, they get a bit hard. But it does mean that hardware engineers, when they're doing those hardware designs, are working out where to put the clock domains, put the clock gated boundaries, actually do have a very good idea of how much a particular unit takes up as power. And so you have at that algorithm level an idea that if I take the FPU out, it will save this much power. Then sort of putting it in the context of the whole system sort of gets messy. Yeah, and particularly as you get into multiple core implementations, you know, I've seen chips that they move the point point unit out, but they have two integer cores or something like this. And you know, does that save power or does putting a point point unit into each chip? You know, that is probably not in your realm, but I, I've seen this in terms of uh, and, and there data are, center power usage. Yeah, and there are good scientific papers measuring that power usage. And in particular, one of the non-obvious things is that it's lower power to use two cores rather than one. Because if it's one core, you have to run it at a high clock frequency, which needs a high voltage. If you've got two cores, you can run them both at the lower frequency. And because <coughs> power is proportional to the square of the voltage, that more than wins from the back of the two computers. Yeah, I was wondering why you look at like, the whole program or not. I mean, usually, the time you spend in a program is very much in very small areas, and also spider optimizations, like they work on very small parts of the program and not look at the whole program. So, why do you not use this uh, plant simulator or models uh, to just look at the important parts? I think that uh, this is similar to what Nick was saying. I think, yeah, it's, a, it's another project. Um, and there are some of our colleagues in Bristol looking at that side of things as well. I think we wanted to see, there is a orthogonal thing, which is to say, whatever I do, what are the particular compiler options, even within that shape, then actually have an impact on that. And it may be, you may, you know, may be the case that actually compiler op uh, optimization doesn't matter so much as finding where that big point is and dealing with that little bit. So, so the, the concern is always is this, all of the spy process, if you like, mix, if you exhaustively try a set of compiler options possible, the, what actually happens is that the compiler doesn't have to make sense. Maybe just random, so it's garbage in, garbage out. So you get a lot of data of garbage in, garbage out. I don't know what conclusions you will drive for us. So if, if, if you magically see the best power saving option includes disable for the process and enable for the others, then it doesn't really tell us what's the issue with this. Oh, absolutely. That, that, that's true. My post is just a learning system, like all learning, most learning systems. You don't actually understand what it's learned. Um, the observation is that in terms of compiler performance, the papers were quite clear that the experimental results show it worked. And, uh, okay. Now, it may, it may be, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm sort of taking this quite positive hope in fact it worked for our optimization. Maybe you will need to read it for every single GCC version. Oh, maybe, maybe. Well, there may be a business opportunity. Let's tune up your mind. <laughs> Any more suggestions? Yes. Uh, we had a similar project about five years ago. There was a paper of the one earlier series of workshops. So uh, the project was to have a uh, compiler effect, basically detecting the memory intensive regions. So after this uh, compiler directed effect, there was a modified experimental manager. Task manager to switch off tasks or to adjust the voltage. And uh, the other project was actually to minimize the switching inside the scheduler, where you can choose instruction for the space, like, a, like an additional schedule heuristic. And uh, that was at the time of the 4.3 series, I think there was not zero at the time. So, uh, my impression from this project is that uh, 
make the compiler either doesn't have all the information you need or the energy that we're trying to save uh, is only a small fraction of the whole power consumption. So we, uh, we had a working framework where we could, uh, on certain tests we could save some percent of the CPU, CPU power consumption, but uh, as the CPU power consumption itself was only a fraction of the total development work, so it didn't matter if we had some. Um, if you have a new chip uh, where you can uh, say, switch off some parts of the chip, it would be better idea to reach the statistics, but uh, at the time it, it didn't quite work out as expected. So I can give you some different space. Uh, okay, that's good. Can your name? Uh, Andre, the demands of time, Russian Academy of Science. What else? Okay, well, I will get James to talk to you after. Okay. The, uh, I'm aware of some of that work, and in particular, one of the sources of power loss is um, switching signal levels. And there has been work trying to order programs so that both the data and the instruction path give you the shortest possible handling distance between successive instructions so you minimize the switching. Um, but again, the papers I've seen on that justify their results only from mathematical models of what the instructions should use as opposed to any measurements. Yeah, the speed switching part of the board is just didn't work out because I think uh, when the scheduler was the same as register payment, you just don't have enough uh, freedom in the compiler to be able to give any pressure for result. And from the dynamic older scale point of view, it was, it was like not bad, but it wasn't the thing that actually uh, uh, worked out in the sense of real power consumption savings. I don't know. Well, thank you all very much. This project will be going on for the next three months. Um, you'll be able to follow it through our website, I hope, how much about what going to be on there. And I look forward to coming back at a future meeting and telling you what the answer was. Thank you all very much.